All right, hi everyone. Um, welcome to part two of the Susan Wolf reading uh, from her book Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. Um, so up to this point, we've gotten a presentation of uh, what Wolf sort of argues is a, a crucial yet overlooked element of the good life, um, which uh, she um, refers to as as meaning. Um, so, you know, we're all familiar with this concept of things that give our life meaning. Now, um, Wolf is arguing that these items or, or these things rather um, are not uh, they're not meaningful because of their, um, because they appeal to self-interest, uh, within us. And they're not meaningful because they appeal to a sense of duty to what is like right from a universal perspective. Um, instead, Wolf is arguing that these things are appealing to us because we love them. Okay, now it sounds a little bit wishy-washy, um, but uh, what she's saying is that there is basically three motivations in life. We're motivated by self-interest, by what we could refer to as morality um, or a sense of duty to what is right. And then Wolf is arguing that this third type, um, we're motivated by the things that we love and that this is actually very different from those other two. Okay. So this is the argument that she's put forward so far. Um, what she's going to move on to now is actually talking about, okay, well, um, what, what is it to have meaning out of something that, um, that you love? Okay. So, uh, as the subheading suggests, a, a conception of meaningfulness in life, um, what Wolf's going to be talking about is, uh, well, how we sort of create that meaning, what we should be looking for. Uh, what is, you know, in the last, um, recording, uh, we discussed the idea of, um, loving things that are worthy of our love. Uh, so, um, let's jump in. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Wolf's going to be arguing here, uh, or not so much arguing, but outlining what it is to find meaning in something. Um, and obviously finding meaning in something that you love. Okay. Uh, so. Let's kick it off. Uh, academic philosophers do not talk much about meaningfulness in life. The term is more likely used by theologians and therapists and by people who are in some way dissatisfied with their lives but are unable to pin down why. We're all very familiar with this concept of like, oh, why aren't you happy in, in your job? Well, oh, I just, I don't see any, any meaning to it. Like it's not, it's not what drives me, that kind of idea. Um, not me, of course. I love my job every second of it. Uh, people sometimes complain that their lives lack meaning. They yearn for meaning. They seek meaning. People sometimes judge others to be leading exceptionally meaningful lives, looking upon them with envy and admiration. Uh, meaning is commonly associated with a kind of depth. Often the need for meaning is connected to the sense that one's life is empty or shallow. So you know, Wolf here is saying, you know, we look at people who have great meaning in their lives uh, in sort of an envious way. Um, you know, we look at their life and, and we wish our life could be so fulfilling, um, you know, so meaningful. Uh, and for those who don't have it, those who are void of it, um, you know, that life then is, you know, we see it as empty. Um, you know, they, they don't have I guess they had they don't have the real spirit of life. Uh, again, if so, wishy-washy a term can be allowed. Uh, an interest in meaning is also frequently associated with thoughts one might have on one's deathbed or in contemplation of one's eventual death. So this is not a bad way to conceptualize what Wolf is talking about here. If you think back, like if you can imagine yourself on your deathbed thinking about the life that you have led, um, you know, the things that would be important to you, they are probably the things that uh, create meaning in your life. Um, very few people, and I certainly hope no one listening to this, gets to their deathbed lamenting the fact that their bank account just wasn't quite big enough at the end. If only they could have had one more zero on the end. Um, you know, this, because, I mean, hopefully you realize the futility of that sort of um, you know, lamentation, it, it's pointless. <laughs> you're, 
you're about to, uh, you know, to scurry off. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how many zeros are in your bank account because it's meaningless to you. Okay. And this is the point. It's meaningless. When we think about what we'll value and what we'll regret um, when we look back upon our lives, Wolf is sort of tapping into this idea of, well, what what is it to have led a good life? And what is it to hopefully get to the end and be able to look at our lives and say, yeah, like that was a life well lived. You know, uh, she's obviously arguing that meaning is is what gives us that. That's the important thing. Uh, when the word meaningful is used in categorizing a life or in categorizing what is missing from a life, it calls something to mind, but it is not clear what, nor is it clear that it calls or is meant to call the same thing to mind in all contexts. So Wolf is identifying here that this like meaning, meaningfulness, this is a very ambiguous statement. Okay, and to a certain degree, quite a subjective statement, like it's going to be different for different people. So she's going to try and sort of nail this concept down a little bit um, uh, in this next part. In offering a conception of meaningfulness, I do not wish to insist that the term is always used in the same way or that what I have to offer it as an analysis of meaningfulness can be substituted for that term in every context. On the other hand, I do believe that much talk of meaning is aimed at capturing the same abstract idea and that my proposal of what that idea is fits well with many of the uses to which the word is put. Whether or not my idea of meaningfulness captures what others mean when they use the term, it is an idea of philosophical interest, for it is an idea of a significant way in which a life can be good, a category or dimension of value, uh, if you will, which we have a serious reason to want for ourselves and for those we care about, and which is neither uh, subsumable nor, uh, so sorry, subsumable under nor reducible to either happiness or morality. Okay, so um, Wolf sort of repeating what she said in the first section uh, is saying, so firstly, meaningfulness should not be confused with you know, common conceptions of happiness, and nor should it be confused with um, ideas of morality or duty. This is something very different. But um, she's also identifying that the definition that she comes to may not be the definition that would be universally accepted. However, she's hoping that the concept that she is able to put forward here um, would be able to be applied when we, when anyone really uses the word meaningful, when they're talking about a life. Um, so she's basically saying, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try and, uh, take this very abstract idea and nail it down. Some people may find this definition, um, uh, imperfect. However, if you take it as a conceptual definition, um, then perhaps this will help us to uh, kind of move forward with the argument. Um, we're all familiar with this concept of meaningfulness in life, what it is for a life to be meaningful. Well, just keep that concept in mind. Um, all right, continuing. According to the conception of meaningfulness I wish to propose, meaning arises from loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way. So these are two sort of key parts here. Um, loving objects worthy of love, part one, and engaging with them in a positive way, part two. Uh, but as we're going to see, Wolf herself identifies this as a little bit too basic and broad. Uh, the words love and objects, however, are in some ways misleading, uh, misleadingly specific, sorry, engaging with objects in a positive way, regrettably vague, and the description uh, of some objects, but not others as being worthy of love, may be thought to be contentious. Rather than try to clarify the view by taking up one word or phrase at a time, uh, let me try to describe the view in other terms, bringing out what I take to be salient. Or, you know, she's basically saying, look, I'm not going to go word by word and say, when I use the word worthy, I am defining worthy as this. When I use the word love, I am defining the word love as this. Instead, what she's going to attempt to do is further clarify the 
um, the idea, the important parts of the idea. When she says worthy, she's not going to define the term. Instead, she's going to try and expand the idea so that we can approach it in a similar or from a, a similar perspective. Okay. What is perhaps most distinctive about my conception of meaning or about the category of value I have in mind is that it involves subjective and objective elements suitably and inextricably linked. Now that is crucially important. Okay. Um, so Wolf is saying that uh, when she's talking about meaning, um, she is going to be referring to things that uh, involve subjective and objective elements, both, and they are suitably and inextricably linked. Um, so that this subjective and objective element will actually come together and be present at the same time, that they are not opposed to each other. Okay. Uh, love is at least partly subjective involving attitudes and feelings. In insisting that the requ requisite object must be worthy of love, however, this conception of meaning invokes an objective standard. Um, so you can say that you love something, this is the subjective view, but to say whether it is worthy of love or not, well, that's an objective statement. Um, you know, people love drugs, for example, this is the subjective perspective, but are drugs worthy of love? Well, absolutely not. Okay, and so this is this is the point that Wolf is trying to make. Okay, that when we say we love something, um, we might be expressing a subjective statement, um, but there might actually be an objective truth to it if that item is worthy of love. Okay, uh, now determining this worthiness will take a bit of work, but. Um, uh, it is implicit in insisting that an object be worthy of love in order to contribute meaning to the lover's life uh, that not any object will do. So you can't just love anything. It has to, as we've said before, be worthy. Nor is it guaranteed that the subject's own assessment of worthiness is privileged. Um, so again, this is not subjective worthiness. You can't think that it is worthy of love. It is either worthy or it isn't. Okay, so no matter how genuinely a drug addict thinks that their drug is worthy of love, um, it's not. Uh, you know, there's an objective reality that they have to deal with. Uh, one might paraphrase this by saying that according to my conception, meaning arises when subjective attraction meets objective attraction. Okay, so this is a, a an important point. Uh, the last dot point on the screen is sort of speaking to it but what what wolf is attempting to do here is take two concepts of love one a subjective love so this is the love that we more commonly refer to okay i love this or i love that or i love him or i love her okay um, this is a subjective view the next type is the objective view of love which is then are that is that thing worthy of love um, you know if we take you know, um, person A is in a relationship with person B and person A uh, is sort of, you know, head over heels in love with this person. Um, they are person A's one and only. Um, they truly do adore them. Uh, they, you know, all the things that we apply to the people we love, they would do anything for them, that sort of stuff um, is all true. Now, person B doesn't love person A as much. Uh, they enjoy their time, they enjoy having fun with them, but they don't share that same um, genuineness in their love. Person B would not do anything for person A. And in fact, person B is, uh, let's say that person B is cheating on person A. Okay, so whilst they're in a relationship with person A, they also pursue relationships with other people. Okay, now we can look at this as a good example of where the subjective love is not fitting with the objective worthiness of love. Okay, whilst person A subjectively loves person B, knowing person B character, most of us would say, well, this person is not worthy of love, or at least of the love that person A is willing to give them. Okay, so 
what Wolf is suggesting is we can get meaning out of the things that we love when our subjective view of that love, so the subjective value, is the same as or meets with the objective value. So when you love someone who is worthy of the love you give them, if we're using the sort of person A, person B example that I was talking about. Okay, now this is a love that can give meaning to life. Before, person A would have not been able to have a meaningful life, uh, in a genuine sense at least. They might have felt that they had meaning in life, but because the objective truth of the, the item of their love, this dirtbag person B, um, is not worthy of their love, then it doesn't do what Wolf is suggesting it has to do, which is be both subjectively and objectively attractive. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Next part. So now where to from here? Okay. So I've got to find something that's subjectively attractive and objectively um, attractive. Uh, how do I do that? What should I look at? Let's go. Essentially, the idea is that a person's life can be meaningful only if she cares fairly deeply about something or things, only if she is gripped, excited, interested, engaged, or, as I earlier put it, if she loves something, as opposed to being bored by or alienated from most or all that she does. Even a person who is so engaged, however, will not live a meaningful life if the objects or activities with which uh, she is so occupied are worthless. So this is the important first point. Okay, the object must be worthy. Uh, um, a person who loves smoking pot all day long or doing endless crossword puzzles and has the luxury of being able to indulge in this without restraint does not thereby make her life meaningful. So hopefully the bell went off in your head as it did mine as I read this, um, which is, uh, you know, this is a direct, um, or we could directly um, compare this view to Callicles. Okay, remember for Callicles, you know, pursue pleasures, indulge in pleasures as much as you possibly can with no mind for good or bad pleasures. Okay, simply pursue pleasures. Well, this is the person who loves smoking pot or loves doing crossword puzzles all day. Let's assume they've accrued enough power that they can do this as, as Callicles would suggest we should do. Um, Wolf here is saying that this does not generate meaning in life. Okay, that person's life would not be meaningful simply because they get to do their crosswords all day. Um, so the, they certainly love something, but it is not worthy of their love. Finally, this conception of meaning specifies that the relationship between the subject and the object of her attraction must be an active one. Okay, now this is the second part. Uh, it has to be something that you engage with. Okay, something that you are involved with. You have to do something with it. Uh, the condition that says that meaning involves engaging with the worthy object of love in a positive way is meant to make clear that mere passive recognition and a positive attitude toward an object's or activity's value is not sufficient for a meaningful life. So I can identify that the work of charities is good and I can admire it from afar and I can identify it as being very meaningful. But this is me basically loving it from afar without actually positively interacting with it, okay? That is not going to create meaning in my life. I must positively interact it. So, you know, a life well lived for, for Wolf, you have to be pursuing something, you know, you can't sit at home uh, and, you know, view valuable things from afar. You have to go and actually positively engage with it. Um, uh, one must be able to be in some sort of relationship with the valuable object of one's attention to create it, protect it, promote it, honor it, or more generally to actively affirm it in some way or other. So you have to be involved with it to do those things. Aristotle is well known for his use of the endoxic method in defending moral and conceptual claims. That is, he takes the endoxa, the things which are accepted by everyone or by most people or by the wise, um, as a starting point in his inquiries. Uh, so, you know, we did come across this with Aristotle when he was talking about, you know, um, you know, we should speak to experts uh, in the field 
um, to determine what a good life is and you know how do we know what virtue is well we have to watch a virtuous person and uh, to help us identify what virtue is because their action is virtuous um, and so this is referred to as the endoxic method okay um, where you support a claim that you are making by saying that it is either the commonly held approach or the commonly held view rather um, or the view held by most people or the view held by the wise okay now um, this method is not without problem it is open to uh, sort of two different fallacies firstly um, you know the ad populum fallacy or the appeal to popular opinion fallacy which is that simply because the group endorses something does not mean that it is correct it doesn't make it right this is the argument we really see from Nietzsche just because the herd um, is many doesn't make their morality right um, and if we're just talking about taking the perspective of the wise then this is an appeal to authority simply because this person has whatever credential means that what they are saying is right well this may not necessarily be the case now whilst these are fallacies that apply to the andoxic method it is worth noting that these are these fallacies do not then mean that this method is incorrect it means it may be incorrect so be very careful with just saying it's wrong because it's got a fallacy um, you know, this in itself is actually a fallacy. It's the fallacy fallacy where you dismiss an argument because it has a fallacy present when that fallacy didn't actually disprove the argument. It just showed a weakness in the way that the argument was put together. So be very careful throwing stones is what I'm saying. Um, the endoxic method does have its problems. However, if you want to live in good health, you speak to a doctor. If you want to build a house, you speak to a builder. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, cook a nice meal, you speak to a chef. Um, we do commonly speak to experts in fields and take their word as being more legitimate or more powerful than others. So the endoxic method certainly does have fallacies within it. This doesn't make it wrong, but it is certainly a weak point that you could choose to attack. Um, just be careful that you don't fall into the trap of saying, well, it is wrong because it has a fallacy in it. Um, the fallacy doesn't make it wrong. It makes it weak. Okay, And that weakness still needs to be exploited. Um, uh, if a view can explain and support these common beliefs, or even better, if it can bring them into harmony with each other, that counts as an argument in its favour. In that spirit, I suggest that my view might be seen as a combination or a welding together of two other more popular views uh, that one often hears um, offered. Uh, if not uh, as analysis of meaning in life, then at least as ingredients, some, sometimes the key ingredients in a life well lived. So basically what Wolf is going to be saying is, look, there's two common things that people say we need in life. Like we hear it time and time again from most people and also from experts. Um, so she's using the endoxic method. These are two ingredients we commonly hear said are required in the good life. I'm going to try and present a philosophy that combines both. And by appealing to both of these points, which are held by the majority and the wise, this should add validity to my argument. This is what she's saying. Okay. The first view tells us that it doesn't matter what you do with your life as long as it is something you love. Do not get stuck or settle into doing something just because it is expected of you or because it is conventionally recognized as good or because nothing better occurs to you. Find your passion. An important point. Okay, This is the first ingredient in the good life, um, discovering passion. Uh, figure out what turns you on and go for it. Uh, the second view says that in order to live a truly satisfying life, one needs to get involved in something larger than oneself. Um, and you know, the, I won't read the footnote, but it attaches to you know, the Australian philosopher Peter Singer, so 
Hey, Peter. Uh, the reference to the size of the group or the object one wants to benefit or be involved with is perhaps misleading and unfortunate, but it is not unreasonable to understand such language metaphorically as a way of gesturing towards the aim of participating in or contributing to something whose value is independent of oneself. So whilst this idea of greater than oneself might sound a little bit ambiguous, um, we're all familiar with the concept of contributing to a field or something that goes beyond just your ego, okay, just your own self-interests, um, you know, being part of something bigger, uh, okay. Understood this way, um, the first view, find your passion, may be understood as a way of advocating something similar to the subjective element contained in my proposed analysis of meaningfulness, while the second view be part of something larger than yourself, urges to satisfy the objective condition. So what Wolf is doing here, so she's built up the idea that, um, you know, meaningfulness is derived from love. Love can exist in multiple ways as subjective, an individual's point of view, and also objective, which is the worthiness of that item to be loved. Um, what she's now saying is, well, this actually lines up with the commonly held views of the ingredients required in the good life. Um, finding your passion is basically saying, find the thing that you subjectively love. And then when other people say, well, find something that you contrib can contribute to that is larger than yourself. Um, well, this is saying to find something that is objectively worthy of love. Okay. She's going to be arguing if we can find something that combines both of these things, then this is uh, something to pursue in the good life. Uh, each of these more popular views is sometimes couched in the vocabulary of meaning, and in each case there is a basis for that choice in our ordinary uses of the term. When thinking about one's own life, for example, a person's worry or complaint that his life lacks meaning is apt to be an expression of dissatisfaction with the subjective quality of that life. Uh, so when when we think about our life, if we say, if we're not satisfied with our life, we feel like it, it's not meaningful. This is usually because of a lack of passion, a lack of the subjective element. Um, some subjective good is felt to be missing. One's life feels empty. One longs to find something to do that will fill this gap and make one feel, as it were, fulfilled. On the other hand, when we consider the lives of others, our tendency to categorize some as especially, especially meaningful and others as less so is apt to reflect differences in our assessments of the objective value of what these lives are about. So when we judge our own life, we usually focus on whether we're doing, uh, you know, following our passion, the subjective side. When we look at other people's lives, uh, we're generally looking at the objective idea and we judge people um, either well or poorly based on whether they are pursuing something that is worthy of love. Okay, uh, think of speaking to someone who is in a in a relationship with someone that you don't agree with. You know, what are the things you say? You should dump him or her. Like the the you're too good for them. Okay, this is the way that we kind of think about people. You know, if you're sitting at home all day playing computer games, well. You might love it, it might be your passion, but it's not worthy of that. You're not actually contributing anything to life, anything larger than yourself. You're purely indulging a passion that is not worthy of it, okay? Um, uh, on the other hand, when we consider the lives of others, our tendency to categorize some as especially meaningful and others as less so is apt to reflect differences in our assessments of the objective value of what these lives are about. When we look for paradigms of meaningful lives, who comes to mind? Gandhi, perhaps, which is the, you know, the Indian leader who uh, led the Indian people out of the um, uh, oppression of the English, um, or Mother Teresa, um, or Einstein, or Suzanne. Now, I'm just going to get on my high horse for a second here. Mother Teresa was not a good person, <laughs> okay? Um, look, I understand that lots of people have fallen in love with an image of what they thought Mother Teresa is. And if you're Catholic, you're probably like 
rallying against me right now, but she was not a nice person. Okay. She, uh, this myth that Mother Teresa, um, you know, helped people who were suffering. She didn't help them. Her advice was embrace, like basically embrace your suffering, be grateful for your suffering. Um, she encouraged people not to try and reduce their suffering, uh, you know, through the use of, of medications or anything like that. Their suffering brought them closer to God, she argued. Um, you know, the, the, we used to burn people at the stake and say that we were, you know, purifying them of their sins. It's the same idea. Um, she took money from, from like demented warlords uh, as long as they were Catholic, but she wouldn't take money from organizations that were genuinely trying to help people because they weren't Catholic. Like she wasn't interested in helping people. She was interested in pursuing her agenda. Um, break the myth, people. Mother Teresa, not a nice person. As Christopher Hitchens said, the angel of death. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, by the way, Einstein, not a nice person either. He was a womanizer and not particularly pleasant, but at least he contributed something to physics. Um, Sisyphus. Now, for those of you who don't know the myth, uh, Sisyphus is condemned, as we're going to see, uh, to rolling a very, very, very heavy boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down and then rolling it up again only to have it roll back down. Uh, and he's condemned to an eternity of doing this. Okay, so now this is important because Sisyphus is sort of going to pop up throughout the reading. So, you know, uh, have a bit of a look around uh, for some information on Sisyphus. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's the crux of it. So Sisyphus condemned to an endless cycle of rolling a huge stone up a hill only to have it roll down again is a standard exemplar of a meaningless existence. So when we look at Sisyphus and we watch him rolling that boulder up the hill and having it roll back down past him, we look at him and we think, what a meaningless existence, right? Uh, what a pointless way to live your life. Um, our choice of these examples seems to be based on the value or lack of value we take these people's activities to have rather than on the subjective quality of their inner lives. Um, so, you know, we value these people, we exalt them because we see their work as being worthy of the love they put into it. Okay. Uh, Sisyphus is, he's stuck toiling at something that is not worthy of it. It's achieving nothing. He's not contributing to anything larger than himself. Okay. Uh, all right. Next part. Uh, basically, we have to have both. We can't just have one or the other. In so far as the conception of meaningfulness, uh, I propose welds these two popular views together. It may be seen as a partial affirmation of both. From my perspective, both these views have something right about them, but each also leaves out something crucial. Why believe any of these views? The question is ambiguous understood as the question, why believe that any one of these views offers a correct analysis of meaningfulness in life? Uh, so basically, well, how do you know that these two things create meaning? Um, the inquiry seems to focus on whether any of the views under consideration captures a property or feature or set of conditions that answers to most of the instances in which the term meaningful is used in ordinary discourse in contexts in which the topic in question is meaningful in life, as opposed to say meaningfulness in language. So basically what Wolf is saying is, well, does this view really connect to the common idea that we put forward when we say we must live a meaningful life? Uh, when we're saying that, are we expressing the concept of subjective and objective, um, you know, attractiveness? Um, uh, uh, in answering this question, we would want to look at how the term is used in ordinary discourse. In what sorts of situations do questions of meaning arise? What sorts of concerns is the presence of meaning in a person's life supposed to put to rest? What types of lives would be generally accepted as paradigms of meaning? What types would be accepted as paradigms of meaninglessness? I've already expressed some doubt about whether there is a single cleanly definable concept 
that is being invoked in all these contexts in which talk of meaningful and meaningless lives may naturally take place. More important than the question of how to use the term meaning in any event is the question of what a good life should contain. Above all, when therapists, ministers and motivational speakers tell you either to find your passion or to contribute to something larger than yourself, they are offering advice about how to live. So she's really talking about the activity. She's trying to give you practical advice in pursuing a meaningful life. Um, she's trying to explain how to live. More important than asking which, if any of these views, offers a plausible conception of meaningfulness is asking which, if any of them, identifies key and distinctive ingredients of a fully flourishing, successful, good life. Okay, so what Wolf is saying here is let's not get bogged down in definition. Um, let's focus on the con a conceptual understanding is all that we need. Let's actually reflect on, well, what are the core ingredients that we see in lives that we see as being fully flourished, successful, and good? What are the parts that need to be present for us to bestow that sort of title or those sorts of titles onto a life? Uh, still, it is difficult to keep the conceptual and normative questions apart. Those who urge us to find our passions or to contribute to something larger than ourselves typically mean to be responding to a more particular set of concerns than is expressed by the general question, how should one live? We cannot properly interpret their advice, much less assess it, without having some idea of what those concerns are. And it would be difficult to call up the intuitions to capture the images and feelings on which it is relevant to reflect without occasionally using the word meaningful in our description. My own proposal, so this is an important part here because Wolf's saying this is how I'm going to work it. My own proposal that we recognize a category of value that is not reducible to happiness or morality and that is realized by loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way is offered as a refinement or as an alternative to these more popular forms of advice. And it is easier to express this in terms that identify the category of value in question with meaningfulness. So again, Wolf is sort of saying, yes, there's lots of debate around this idea of meaning in life and how do we define it? And it usually, you know, a lot of the time people are talking about meaning in life and connecting it to pursuing a certain career, which is not necessarily true. Uh, sometimes they're talking about, you know, um, finding, you know, it, it can only be derived from having children, which is not necessarily true. So people use this idea of meaning in life in lots of different ways. Wolf is going to try and give us a sufficiently clear definition, but one that would actually cover any of those pers like perspectives um, in her work. And, and she's putting forward, so if you go back to the start of where I said, you know, this is her view, um, we recognize a category of value that is firstly, so it's not reducible to happiness or morality. It's not the same as either of these. Secondly, it is realized by loving objects, that's a subjective, that are worthy of love, that's the objective, and engaging with them in a positive way, that's the actual activity. Okay, so it's not something that is the same as happiness, it's not the same as morality, it's something that I love, that is worthy of my love, and that I actually do something with, I take part in. Okay. Um, no harm, I hope, will be done by this, as long as we are alert to the possibility of filtering out questions about how to understand and apply the term meaningful from questions about uh, what to aspire to in life, we can be careful to ensure that no question, uh, no questions will be begged. Okay, so what Wolf is basically saying here, is, as long as we remain sort of vigilant um, that She's not offering this really as a definition of the word meaningful. She's offering it as a, a, a process by which you can generate meaning. Okay. Um, so what to aspire to. Okay. This is what to aspire to, what you should pursue in your life, uh, not a definition of the term meaningful. Okay. Um, all right, we'll leave it there. The next is the fulfillment view. 
okay? Um, so look, I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite, quite enjoying Wolf. I quite like her philosophy. Um, so hopefully you are too. Hopefully you're getting a little bit out of it. Uh, and Megan, here's your shout out. Hope you're having a great day, you know? Hope things are good, um, but in excess is still overrated. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.